architects, like lawyers, can be very singularly focused and decide that their whole life's mission is to design, but there's a lot more involved in running a business than, than sitting at a computer, sitting at a drafting table, and designing. Episode 109. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Today is part two of my conversation with Patty Harris. We're going to talk about business entities for architects and which one is best for you. Patty Harris is one of the world's leading authorities on entity formation for architecture firms. And in the past, she spent 13 years as the managing partner of a New York City-based construction law firm. Uh, in addition to overseeing the business operations of the firm, she advi advised clients on office and business management issues. So it's a pleasure to have Patty here with us today. She really gets business, and she's going to have some interesting things to share with us about business formation for architects. So with that, here's today's show. Well, Patty, let know. Let's let's talk about let's jump over to the uh, the different business entities. Let's try to break it down. Uh, sure. Tell me about the different business entities that are available to architects, and give us a little primer here so our people listening can get sort of an understanding. And then, if they okay. want to go further, they can give you a call, and contact okay, your great. your company. So the the corporate entities, the sticky thing you always need to be aware of is what's called double taxation. Now I feel like I'm in law school and business school. And what that means is if a company makes money, a company, a corporate corporation, it, it, it has corporate income taxes. And after those corporate income taxes are paid and there's some kind of net income, which, is that, which goes to the owners who are, who are people, the people, again, pay personal income taxes. So this is called double taxation. You can get around that, um, and I'm sure most people are familiar with the term, you make a subchapter S election, and that way the corporate tax part of it disappears, and each owner takes uh, his, his income taxes at the ratio of his ownership. So if a firm makes $100 in a year, and somebody owns 75%, and somebody owns 25%, one of them's going to have personal uh, income in the amount of $75, the other guy in the amount of $25, and they'll pay taxes on that. Um, the subchapter S is a little bit restrictive. So if you're building a really, really big design firm, you need to stay away from it. You, you can only have up to 100 shareholders in a sub S. Um, you, you can't have any non-resident aliens as shareholders. You can't have any entities like ESOPs as shareholders. So there were certain restrictions on that sub S election, which, um, you know, which can perhaps interfere with your business plans. The other thing with the professional corporation is that most states require that every shareholder be a licensee of that state or certainly a licensee of some state. So that's, that's a pretty restrictive entity type. If you've got other people like your CFO or your chief marketing officer who you want to have as a shareholder in your firm. Um, the limited liability company is not recognized by all 50 states. I'm not sure how many recognize it, but I know it's not all 50. But it's a really nice, flexible type of, of entity if, if you can get it. Um, it's probably the one that's least managed by statutory written law. So what you end up doing if you have an LLC is you have, you do have to bring in a lawyer for this. You have an operate, what's called an operating agreement drafted and 
you, you know, we can talk about how we're going to get income, how we're going to split our profits, how the voting is going to go. And it's very, very flexible. It can do whatever you want with it. You can, you know, maybe you have a guy who, who is, uh, who's established a business and you're a young guy coming in and, and you do an LLC together and somehow account for the fact that one guy's the, the sweat and the other guy's sort of built the business, but he's kind of leaving the business. And there's, you can sort of do voting and, and income sharing mechanisms within that, that that are really helpful. But again, that one is not necessarily recognized by all um, states. The limited, uh, the professional limited liability partnership uh, it seems to be falling out of favor a little bit, and I really can't tell you why. Um, I think it's mostly because the LLC is just what's in vogue. I don't think there's any specific reasons for it. I will say that a partnership needs more than one partner. Um, you can have a single member LLC. Um, and then the fourth is is the corp. And I'd be surprised if maybe half, maybe half, maybe half of the states allow you to have a corporation, a company. Again, you you, you want to deal with the sub S, sub chapter S side of that on that. But those are the, those are the four major forms: the the regular corporation, the professional corporation, the professional limited liability company, and the professional limited liability partnership. Then occasionally. Um, you have special entities in special states. So the one I've been alluding to the most today is the Design Professional Service Corporation. That's a relatively new animal here in New York. It was established in 2012. And it was established because every entity type in New York required every owner to be a New York licensed owner. And it just wasn't flexible enough for people doing trying to do business here. So the general rule with that one is as long as um, licensed professionals own more than 75.01% and fulfill certain director and officer positions within the entity, you can, you can put the other 24.99% to people you value in your organization who maybe are not licensed as well as ESOPs. Um, we also have something in New York, which I said, I'll say one set, two sentences on it, the grandfathered corporation. Um, if there is, that is a regular corporation, um, it, you had to have been in continual business as a design professional entity th since I think 1919, 1920 something. Um, and what those, those corporations are traded, they're bought and sold. So, uh, by, by larger firms. So if you want to be a corp, they're on the market. They cost about a million and a half dollars right now. I believe that's the going rate for a grandfathered corporation in New York. But that that enables you to have non-licensed participants in your firm. Mm. Is that something that larger firms will normally do, or who who would be the market yes, for one of those? It's larger firms. Um, it's firms that maybe have. Uh, extremely, extremely well-known design professionals who, for one reason or another, are not licensed in the state of New York. But, but I'd say most of them are really large firms. Gotcha. Okay. So that's that's a quick primer. So I guess we have the the ones that would be most applicable to uh, our listeners in in every state would be the professional corporation, the normal corporation. We have the limited liability company, the LLC, and then there was the limited liability partnership. Those are them. Okay. That's it. Now you mentioned that since these are entities, a big part of this is actually the limiting of personal liability. Well, I guess so we have personal liability on one hand and we have business liability on the other. Could you sort of differentiate those two? Yes. Um, okay. So really the, the difference is, is malpractice. Um, business liability is anything that happens really directly related or coming out of your business. If you happen to lease cars in your business and you get in a car accident, that would be a business liability issue. Um, we were in the middle of Manhattan. We, uh, our, our office was down for four straight days um, during 9-11. We lost a lot of lawyer hours. We lost a lot of income during that four day period. So we tried, you know, that was a liability to the business. We tried for business interruption insurance. Well, that's a little bit different. Um, 
if you have a lease and your business signs it, a lease for office space, and you don't have a personal guarantee, um, that's a business liability. If someone comes in your office and trips and falls or otherwise hurts themselves, that's a business liability. The, per, the personal liability you have is, is professional malpractice. And that cannot be sheltered, particularly if you've been negligent, that cannot be sheltered within your business entity. So you can't hide behind your corporate veil, as they say, if you commit malpractice um or or if you are negligent um that is why you should procure professional liability insurance in any scenario um to make sure that you're protected both on, in terms of legal expense as well as any ultimate uh damages if if something goes wrong on one of your projects so if you're working out of your home and your practice is very quiet um maybe you only do residential design maybe not a lot of it um you still want to talk to a broker about making sure that you're protected you know i only do four projects a year six projects a year um and they should be able to right size and give you an affordable protection for that you don't have any employees or anything there just isn't there isn't a lot of business liability in that scenario um but once you once the business itself is signing contracts, signing obligations, um, having employees, these are all really good reasons that you may have business liability. If you have an employee and they hurt themselves or you have to terminate them and you know whatever it is, um, you don't want them coming after you personally if there's some problem. So you want to have that shelter of that, that entity. Okay. So for instance, if I have a lease out on a, a commercial property and for whatever reason, I'm forced to walk away from that, mm -hmm. uh, I would be protected from that debt because of the, the entity? Yes. If Enoch Sears Incorporated or PC signed that lease, then all that is available if you wander off for whatever reason are whatever assets are in that entity. Now, landlords have certainly gotten a little more sophisticated and particularly with respect to new businesses where they say, you know, I'm really glad to have you here and I'm really fine with um, your business signing this lease. But there's going to be one little page at the end. It's called personal guarantee. Um, and that that's the killer. And that one says, Hey, listen. If your if your business uh, comes to an end and this lease hasn't yet, it's on you, pal. And I'm going to go after you for it. So, um, so I think new businesses do see that a bit. I I would still at that once you start taking on things, particularly employees, I think it's time to really say to yourself, is it time um, to form an entity? It's not. It shouldn't be that expensive. There are annual fees. Um, there's annual filings, which aren't really heavy lifting. It's not that big of a deal um, unless you have, oh, unless you have partners or fellow owners, in which case I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage um, a shareholders agreement or an operating agreement if you're an LLC. Um, in fact, that's another reason I should have said up front. If you have, if you're going into a business with someone besides yourself, I think that's, that you should definitely have the entity protection. Not so much for the protections I talk about and the liabilities, but because I'm hoping through that, somebody's gonna be forced to sit and create the prenuptial agreement, which is this other stuff. And the best time to do that is when everybody's rosy and excited. So if things don't go as planned at the very beginning, that's a really bad time to say, hey, <laughs> what about that shareholders agreement? Just the wrong time. So, so uh, let's dig into that a little bit. How could that go wrong? And what do you mean by prenuptial agreement? Why is it so important for partners? Do you have any examples you can give there of just why, why okay. that's so essential? So um, when I'm, I'm teasing with the word prenuptial agreement and I'm talking about the corporate agreements, what, whether it's the partner, the, if you're a partnership, it's a partnership agreement. If you're a corporation, it's a shareholders agreement. And if you are a, um, a LLC, an LLC, it's an operating agreement. And it forces, I had three young women come to me 
they were uh, none of them have they're all studying to be licensed architects, but none of them are licensed architects. Um, they're getting ready to sit for the exam. They were very excited. They wanted to open an interior design business and then they would convert it into an architecture firm once they all passed. So we started chatting about what, what this was all about. And it turned out that one of the women was going to be supplying all the money to underwrite this, this beginning of this business. And I don't know them. So it could be that one or more takes a longer period of time to pass the exams than the others and therefore is a little limited in her ability to perhaps bring in funds, to bring in income to the, to the firm. Um, I could, they were very young. There, were a lot of, there was a lot of giggling. They were very happy and excited, but it just made me very, very nervous. And I said, you know what? Even if, you know, I'll, I'm happy to incorporate you because I, you know, not, my business does not do those agreements. I'm also happy to recommend you to a law firm. But I beg you, if nothing else, if you if you don't want to spend the money on law firm fees until you're an architecture firm, which apparently you're all ha hoping will happen imminently, like go on to the web, find a form of agreement, and just sit down with a bottle of wine and a like really big napkin, and read each of those headings and talk about them. So talk about you know who's putting in what to get this business started who's putting in cash is she going to be paid back before you all start to draw money out of this firm is she going to get interest on the money that she's putting into the firm what if it turns out that one of you is you know really likes to leave at five o'clock and the other two of you really like to stay till midnight and you all get in at nine in the morning you know you may be all saying that you're going to stay till midnight but then it one starts to sort of wander off what are you going to do? Are you know? Are are you going to everybody take an equal third, third, third? Um, what if there's a decision? What if it becomes time to hire an employee? Who's going to decide that? Who's going to decide what the stationery is going to look like? I, the, it's the strangest, most mundane things that people don't realize that they don't think through when they're so happy to be beginning a business together. So that is why I would strongly suggest if there's more than one coming together to start a business that they sit down as i said these agreements certainly the agreement headings are very generic and any intelligent person can share them and talk about their expectations and you really want to do it before um any problems arise so that you really all have a roadmap of what the expectations are and how this business is going to run how people are going to be paid. Um, obviously, the money issues are the most important issues. Um, the voting issues uh, are sort of second most important. The other thing that nobody ever thinks about is what if some what if something happens to somebody? What if they just decide they don't like it and they leave? What if they get hit by a bus one day? Um, what if what if they get what if the business is really successful and they get divorced? Like, does, does their spouse get to come in as a partner of the firm and, and he or she is not licensed? I mean, it's so again, you know, you just you just kind of want to not just think about, but have agreement on on what these things are. So you all understand what you're getting into. Thank you for that explanation, Patty. <laughs> sure. So when we um, just to maybe close up here, could you? I'm just trying to look for some recommendations. I know it's hard to give carte blanche, you know, this is going to apply to everyone. But if you were to maybe take a couple of the demographics of my listeners, we might have yes. um, we might have people who are, um, you know, sole owners mm -hmm. who may do some outsourcing. They may be looking at hiring employees soon. They may be starting to get into business leases, moving out of a home office. You mm -hmm. know, what entity might be might be might they want to consider and the advantages or disadvantages? I, um, that's a good question. I would say if things are simple and clear cut and you are a solo or you have two equal partners, I, I think the corporate, the professional corporation, the corporate form is a good one. I don't think the sub chapter S election is going to mess anything up for you. Um, I, 
I would, my guess would be that that's a pretty common form for many firms. And to the degree that you become successful and you want to travel um, within any state in, in the U.S., that, that is the only form that is recognized by all states in the U.S. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of shareholders agreements and corporate filings, in ways, going back to what we talked about and forms and technology, I think forms and technology are very supportive of that entity type. Um, so in many ways, I think that's the most inexpensive one that you, you can organize of, of all of them. Um, I strongly encourage you to make sure that whoever you're using for formation or organization, whether it be a lawyer or, or a vendor, understands that you are an architect and that you may, may be subject to the architecture regulatory board of your state. So there may be an additional step involved in forming you. Um, we certainly see plenty of clients that come to us who were not, who did not make that step. And honestly, they come to us to cure them and, and nobody's gotten in trouble in the process of being cured. You never want to be found out. Um, but you, you just want to make sure that that's done correctly. And, and to that end, you can actually just go to your, go to the web, go to your state architecture board. And it's pretty apparent within two or three clicks about whether they care um, if there's an application for firm licensure or there isn't. If there isn't, then you're probably free and clear. Okay. And you can always call them. Everybody's pretty nice, except for New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> what are uh, some of the, the biggest, I, I guess, mistakes or errors that people are coming to you with and you're having to untangle. So kind of what advice would you give to people starting out this process? You already gave us some advice, which is have an operating agreement, have a shareholders agreement. Have an entity if it's, if it's okay. important to do so. Yep. Um, I think the untangling is, is exactly what I said, that someone has formed a company without recognizing that they're an architecture or an engineering firm, that there are additional hoops to jump through. Um, in virtually every case, that is the problem. Um, we had an interesting case about a year ago where it was a landscape architect and they were operating here. Actually, I don't think they were, I don't think they were in New York, New York. It was another state. They were operating and it came to their attention, uh, that they needed to be licensed through they were they were residing in another state and they were going to work here in New York and they were working here in New York, but it then came to their attention they needed to be licensed in New York as a firm. So um, they they wanted this the name they'd been operating under and they had contracts that were existing in that name and that corporate entity, and uh, New York said no. <laughs> we're you know, I said, look, we're trying to comply. Like this, these clients just realized that they needed to be licensed. They've been operating and they're trying to do the right thing, but they've created like some goodwill. They have a name, they have a website, you know, they've had a couple of years. And they said, give us an affidavit promising that this entity will, will the, uh, either change its name or not do any landscape architecture or something. And we did that, and then they still came back and said no. Um, we ended up basically having to change the name of the of the firm, I think in New Jersey, to be something totally different. Go ahead and register the one here in New York with the with the name that that they had, and I think ultimately kind of might have wheeled back in New Jersey after we were done in some way and retrieved the name. But I remember. Like I felt like I was some kind of spy. We had to like take their website down and, you know, do all this other work to make sure that, you know, New York understood that they were complying mm. with what New York needed while we were trying to get them straight. But um, 
I think it's either lawyers, organizers, or or principals themselves just don't realize this. And that's unless somebody starts with us and they realize it right away. Um, that's that's the only problem there is. And then untangling it depends. Mm. Well, Patty, you've given us a a great overview. And I mean, you know, people are going to have to get, they're going to have to get personal advice. There's probably enough intricacies there that they're going to want to get, uh, reach out to you and speak to you. What's the process of working with uh, licensure? And tell us okay. about your website and tell us about your process, how, what you can offer to people and the process they should go to to have you help them out. Thank you um, for asking. So as a startup business, um, I had an image of what the business would be and I found myself pivoting quickly. My image of what the business would be was it would be a totally web-centric process for people to basically provide me with information and me provide them with an entity, a licensed entity. And it very quickly became apparent that um, that was not going to work, that um, people are rightfully very nervous. This is not um, an area that, that design professionals are expected to be familiar with. Um, and a lot of people ask, uh, as pertinent to their specific facts and circumstances, what you were asking, here's my situation. Does it make sense for me to be a PC? Does it make sense for me to be an LLC? Or here's my situation. I'm in Florida as this type of entity, but I'm about to do business in New York. So what's the easiest way for me and cheapest way for me to get into New York, comply with the New York regulation? So um, my website, licensure.biz, and that's two words. It's one word, but it's the two words of license sure. Um, has both my email as well as my telephone, our telephone number on it. Um, and send me an email, leave me a message, call me. Uh, more than happy to chat with people um, and, you know, help help you sort of figure out the lay of the land. Um, what makes you nervous and makes you feel complicated is it doesn't make me too nervous or complicated typically. Um, you know, I don't enjoy telling people that they're committing a felony, but it, but if that's the case, I'm happy to you know share that with them. Um, but solutions to these problems are usually quick in coming, um, with the understanding that we're going to be dealing with regulatory boards and names and whatever other strange requirements um, they have. But uh, but I'm pretty lucid on those as well. So I welcome your viewers um, to call or email me with any, any questions they have on this. I feel like we went through so much. It was like very dense, but. Uh... It was, and you know, I'm sure people would go back and listen to it again. People often tell me they do that, you know, just, I, I think I got a lot of value out of the interview. Patty, is there anything that you'd like to close with for our listeners? Anything else you feel that we left out? Um, I, I just want to say that if someone is watching this program and involved with your website, uh, I, I give you all of the praise and encouragement in the world, particularly, you know, small firms don't have the luxury of hiring a lot of different people to support their work. And architects, like lawyers, can be very singularly focused and decide that their whole life's mission is to design. But there's a lot more involved in running a business than than sitting at a computer, sitting at a drafting table and designing. So I applaud your recognition that you want to have a good business and learn how to take care of and nurture the business. So keep on doing that. It's really important and it, it will be the foundation for your success. Good. I want you listeners to know that, you know, Miss Harris just said that you are smart for listening to business of architecture. <laughs> I for said Karen. it as a lawyer using a lot of words, but you're right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, there's the fact you're listening to this. You are among the top and you're headed for success if you're not already there. Well, Patty, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And we've been speaking today with uh, Patty Harris. She's one of the world's leading authorities on entity formation for architecture firms, as you've just found out. And as I mentioned before, she's has an MBA. She also has a law degree, so she's very knowledgeable. And thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with our listeners and serving the AEC community. Great. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Okay. Bye. 
And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.